This is a production of Cornell University. Um, but IR4 project, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but what we do is we're a publicly funded program. Actually, it is USDA funds, but some of the money comes into the university. I work at Rutgers University. I'm actually a Rutgers employee. And then uh, the, the money comes in, and we really develop regulatory type of data to register products for specialty crops and minor uses. We're really looking at those, those growers that industry doesn't find registering products for them profitable, so then we do it for them. So, so that's a word from my sponsor. We've actually been, been uh, doing this type of work for 50 years. We're celebrating our 50 year anniversary this year. But what I really want to talk about today is really ag trade. And uh, talking with Brad, I, I have a new, new name for, for what it is now. I said free trade, is it really free, uh, free trade? But it's really a technical barrier to trade. And, and I'll talk about pesticide residues and whatnot in, in, the, in, in the coming slides. But I really want to just give you an idea of what trade looks like, ag, ag trade and where it's been. And really what's the most exciting is what's really happened in the last five, five this, really since, well, 2008, things kind of dropped a little bit, but it's just been on a rapid growth since then. And you can see from 2010, it was $115 billion uh, US exports going out to other countries. And then it increased to 141,000, 141 billion uh, in just those two years. So you, you can really see the rapid amount of increase that we've had. And, and I think in, in many of the ag industries, we, we, can see what, we can see those increases as well. Uh, Canada and Mexico has always been the US major ag trade partner. And we've always run with a surplus in our, in our trade to Canada. Uh, but we have Canada here, the red line, Mexico. Again, we had a little drop in 2008 in many of the markets. But uh, then it's been a steady increase with Canada and Mexico. But the one to really look at it is really uh, China and the way that it's just been a steady increase from about $7 billion up to over $25 billion of ag commodities going to China. The EU is a little bit more of a mature market, so it hasn't really changed too much. And there's been a number of legislative and, and other policies that have been in effect that I think has probably precluded some of the growth in that area too. I put India on here just to see you know, we have another country there with over a billion people in it. Is that a market that's still out there that's waiting to be uh, exercised and, and see if we can uh, increase our, our exports to India as well? Just looking at it by commodities, um, I'm looking at China. Here's soybeans, uh, almost $15 billion of that 25 plus billion going to China. That's soybeans going over there. Then soybeans in, in our other Canada, Mexico, and uh, the EU, uh, you can see there's, there's several billion dollars there as well. When I get to the next commodities, you, you can see that it's, uh, the value isn't nearly as high. But if we look at fresh vegetables going to Canada, that's our primary market. So the lettuce, the onions, you know, a lot of the fresh vegetables that we export, a lot of those are really going to Canada. Then we look at pulses, beans. Peas, dry beans, dry peas. Uh, Mexico's uh, probably one of our largest markets there. Um, but, but then uh, the EU is also a significant amount of market there. And some of these commodities, they actually may be exported to the EU, but then they go to other countries as well from there. Tree nuts, the EU is our, our primary exporter for tree nuts. Uh, $1.7 billion going there and then other markets as well. A lot of the products, this, this is actually from 2001 to 2003, but this is, this is the percent of crop growing that is going out to the other markets, uh, out, out for export. So you can see like the almonds and cotton, you know, s almost 70% of the commodities being exported, grapes, uh, almost 60%. Soybeans, pulses, apples, probably citrus, pears. I put these on here. This was 2001, 2003. But I think most all of the ag expansion has not been domestic. It's all been going to export markets. So I think really even though this is from 2001, 2003, probably these commodities have far exceeded this, this 20 to 30% of the market going to export. It's probably closer to 50% now. <clears throat> 
And then again, this, this is from uh, 2005. Uh, exports were about 62 billion. I mentioned earlier we're, we're over 140 billion now. But how does that impact the, the work environment and contributing to other economic activity? So U.S. agricultural exports that support additional services. So when we're, when we're shipping things international, you have the truck drivers that are taking it to the ports. You have uh, other commodities, uh, potatoes gets chipped, uh, french fries. So supporting all the other uh, business activity more than doubles the economic impact that you have from these export commodities. So it's a pretty good story there on what's happening internationally. But what, what I really want to talk about is you have pests, you got to control pests, you have to maintain a high quality product when, when you're going to be exporting these commodities, and pests really influence that. So the pesticides currently are really a re reality for these, these large volumes of commodities that we're producing and exporting. And <clears throat> I've borrowed a lot of slides throughout my presentations from the Foreign Ag Service, from different grower groups. So this was a comment that was provided by the California Citrus Quality Council at a meeting that I was at. And they feel that the pesticides are really, uh, they need those technologies to control uh, plant diseases and insects. They really have to have it to, to maintain a high level of phytosanitary demands. And, um, and then growers, large and small, depend on pesticides to control plant disease, insects. And I, I added weeds here too, Robin. I, I couldn't let that go. So. And then also the, the pesticides. And, and I'm going to talk about some of the pesticides that are really more important to the IPM programs, a lot of the newer ones that actually work into IPM programs more so than the older products. Uh, but I'm going to talk to those uh, in, in a few slides. But uh, they'll, they'll continue to play a key role in the IPM uh, programs as well. So this technical trade barrier, this uh, thing that may uh, cause problems with our so-called free trade, it's the maximum pesticide residue uh, levels. And that's really what a legally allowable amount is, is allowed on food and feed stuff. Um, and that, that's what results on the commodity after it's been used according to a, a good, good agricultural practice or according to the pesticide label. So sometimes you have some of these uh, residues from the pesticide that persist on the commodity. And then for import tolerances, the import tolerance is an MRL that's, that's set on the basis of the foreign registered good agricultural practice. And then just some other considerations. Um, again, to maintain a high level of productivity, uh, the, the growing world population, uh, the food exports and imports uh, will obviously continue to rise. And now the growers, especially here in the United States, really uh, grow to support a global market. And as we all know, we all like to have fresh fruits and vegetables uh, when we go to the supermarket. So again, uh, this is from the citrus growers, but the growers really don't, don't grow a commodity. Uh, they're not really sure where that commodity is going to go when they're growing it in the field. So they don't really manage their production uh, for a specific market that they're going to. And then even the processors will, will mix lots and, and, and mingle things together. If there's no MRL in any of the markets that they're going to, then generally the pesticide isn't used. So, and, and you can see for citrus some of the major markets that they're, they're, they're shipping to here. The Food Quality Protection Act was, was passed in 1996. And it, it really changed the paradigm of products that we use uh, when we grow our crops now. It's, it's reduced risk products. That's probably 90% 90, 90 of the markets that are, that are 90 percent of the products that are on the market are reduced risk products. Uh, many of the organophosphate insecticides uh, and other classes of insecticides have, have either been removed from the market or they've been significantly restricted in the, in the amount of use that they can be that can be used. And many of these uses have been replaced by safer products. And uh, one thing to mention is uh, as a result of the, the Food Quality Protection Act, 
that it actually required a more comprehensive risk assessment of each of the products. And in that risk assessment pro uh, process, they actually determined it wasn't really the commodities that were the issue, but in most cases it was the applicator. So m most of those insecticides were, were removed from the market because of the ap applicator exposure, and they, and they were exceeding the safe levels for the applicators. <clears throat> And also, finally, uh, many of the new products are really more IPM compatible. Oops. They're more IPM compatible because they, they don't impact the beneficials to the level that the older products did. Um, they can be used in more specific sites of uh, action. Um, this, this was a slide that was given to me from the Northwest Horde Council, and they, they just kind of went through what were the products they used in 19, uh, 1983 to control uh, codling moth. Azenfos methyl, phosmet, I don't even know what this one is, phosylone, methylparathion. I mean, we all knew methylparathion was bad in, in 83. Uh, it was still being used in 98, but now, now really the only organophosphate is phosmet. And many of these other ones are considered reduced risk products, especially the chl uh, chlorantranopril and the methoxyphenicide. But these work on very specific sites of action on the insects. If you continue to use a lot of them, you're going to get resistance. So the toolbox has to be bigger so you can rotate your chemistries and prevent resistance as well. <clears throat> so, before you go on, can you tell people what reduced risk is so that they know what that means? Yeah, I have another slide coming up, and, and I'll talk about that a little more. But really, uh, when you talk about risk, you're talking about the hazard and the exposure. So uh, when you talk about reduced risk products, you mostly focus on the hazard part of the equation. The exposure may be equal to or greater on, on the reduced risk products. You know, the exposure may be equal to or greater on these because you don't, many of these, you don't need a, a applicator protection equipment when you're, when you're making the applications because they are, uh, the level of, of hazard is so low that they don't, they don't have to be concerned about it. Obviously, if they're applying Fosmet, they're going to have you know, the, the overhauls on, they're going to have a mask on. Uh, but with a lot of these other compounds, really, probably all you need is like uh, rubber gloves and, and maybe some, a splash uh, apron or something like that. So, but we're really, with the reduced risk, we're really talking about the hazard part of the risk equation. And I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a cold right now, so I sound a little rougher than I normally do. <clears throat> so IPM, again, I, I think we talked about a lot of that, but how these new products really fit into IPM programs. And one actually that was submitted to the agency really just about a year ago is actually uh, even uh, safe to the pollinators. So it, it's safe to bees and other pollinators as well. So you can see this transition from the OPs, reduced risk, and uh, these products that are moving into it. But the problem that we're having is we've registered these products for the growers in the U.S., but some of the other countries don't recognize those products. They've never seen them. They've never seen the tox packages that were used to support them. So when we're exporting our commodities abroad, then they, they say, well, I don't know if the residues from this compound are safe or not. So that, that's really what I'm going to focus my talk on today. And the growers don't always know where their, their uh, commodities are going. Uh, globalization could preclude the use of a new pest control product, a new, a new pest control product that may be very valuable to an IPM program as well. And the use of any pesticide, and actually what I've seen is, is even some of these newer products, we're actually seeing probably a li little bit higher residues from the pesticide. They got very short treatment, the harvest interval, and some of them actually stay, stay active in the plant for a longer period of time too. So we're we're actually seeing probably a little more residues present in the plant than we did like with the pyrethroids or the organophosphates because a lot of those are just kind of, you go on, you make your application and then the compound would break down fairly quickly. But the newer products don't break down quite as quickly, but they're a lot safer. <coughs> All right, so major market export flow you know, we, I talked about the trade within the U.S., Mexico, Canada. We have a lot of trade going, going back and forth there. But then we have trade to Europe. We have trade to Asia, Australia, New Zealand. 
South America trades with us. They bring the, the, the trade up to us. But then we even find that we have trade going. We may be shipping something out from one place and then something else comes back. So it's very complicated now that the trade paths and there's a lot of people that are studying, you know, uh, the, the citrus people, for example. What are our ma major trade our, uh, markets that we're going to? Uh, the companies that develop some of these products. Okay, if I develop it, develop it for use on lettuce, where do I need to make sure that I have trade MRLs established for those markets that our growers are going to use? And then just some other considerations is it's, it's not necessarily even that you're going to consume it, but I mean, uh, from my discussion with the cranberry growers, they grow the cranberries in Maine, Massachusetts, New Jersey. Sometimes they'll just ship them right across the border just to get them juiced and then they want to bring them back into the country. But if there's a pesticide residue on them, they can't do that because uh, Canada didn't recognize that MRL that was, was being used on it. In some cases, in other cases, it, it, may, be, uh, it may be okay to, to ex export it to Canada. And then grapes, we've seen a similar thing. Even grapes coming from Ontario into New York, we've had some issues with some pesticide residues appearing uh, on the commodities. <clears throat> So the, the uh, maximum residue limits, the pesticide residues, can really preclude some of these shipments and, and really more uh, efficient and, and more use uh, of the resources that are available to the growers, like the juicing plants and whatnot. So uh, my friend from the Northwest Hort Council, he said, why do you always use apples? And you know, that's like the commodity that we've decided to use. But you know, in the US, we may have a use pattern and it results uh, in, in a five part per million residue level on, on the apples. And then you have in Canada, well maybe they don't need so much so they have a lower MRL on, on the apples in Canada. And then you have, you go around the world, there's different use patterns. Uh, you know, maybe some are used pre-bloom, post-bloom. So depending on where you are in the world, you may have a di different pesticide residue limit on that commodity. So you can imagine when you're trying to trade your apples in the U.S. that were treated and, and they could result in, a, in five parts per million and you're trying to export to other parts of the kind of issues that you can run into. So in the ideal world, then everybody would have the same RL. So that's kind of where we want to get with the harmonization. So I'm, I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit, just talk about uh, registration and how pesticides are regulated for a few minutes and then I'm going to come back to some of, some of the other trade issues. But in the U.S., uh, really EPA is the only body that really regulates pesticides. It's, it's regulated under the um, <clears throat> Federal Insecticide Fungicide Rodenticide Act and there's just been a number of amendments that have been made from, from year to year. The Food Quality Protection Act actually made amendments to the, the FIFRA uh, act. And then in, in the, in the uh, North American countries, we have PMRA, Pest Management Regulatory an uh, Agency that regulates pesticides in Canada. And then Mexico, it's a little similar to what we used to do here and some of the other countries do it as well. They have, they have like a, a health department and they have an ag department and then they work together to regulate the pesticides. And then globally we have the EU, the European Commission, uh, Korea, China, and uh, I think probably what we'd like to see is, is that all of these countries work under the Codex standards. Codex is an Altamarius kind of a, a global standard that's recognized in some countries, but not all countries, as, as a standard for uh, pesticide uh, residue limits. <clears throat> and then the, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, they don't really uh, set standards, but they provide uh, guidance documents uh, to the member countries that work with them. So in, in the U.S., when you're going to submit a pesticide, you have to generate data in all these different areas. This is a conventional product. I'm going to talk about biopesticides and, and microbials in a few minutes, but you have to, you have to generate data in all these different areas uh, it, before you can get your product registered in the U.S. <clears throat> so you have your, uh, your product properties, fate, transport, environmental fate, spray drift, ecological effects, chemistry, health effects, test, testing guidelines. These are all your cancer studies that you're doing with uh, 
various test, test animals. That's actually uh, going through changes now where, where they're going to, they call it Century 21 tox, and they're going to be doing more uh, in vitro testing instead of animal testing. <clears throat> Occupational, residential exposure. These, all these studies actually could cost probably up to, from when a company decides to develop a product and they're going to take it to the registration, it's about $250 million worth of studies that they invest. And then some of the, the more recent studies that they, they were uh, required, but most people use waivers in the past, but now they actually have to generate data, but developmental neurotox and immunotox studies as well. <clears throat> um, and then for some of our other areas, like the microbial pesticides, biochemicals, for the, the conventional products, there's three divisions in EPA that, that review the data that comes in for them. For these products, they're, they're independent uh, divisions that, that uh, cover them. So for the biochemicals, uh, mo in most cases, you're going to get an exemption from an MRL, exemption from a tolerance, but the division still has to review what we call a six-pack of tox data just to make sure that there's no toxicological concerns with those biologicals. And then microbials, that's more of your, your uh, counter cleaners and, and items like that. And, and again, they don't have to go through the extent of environmental fate and uh, type of studies there. But they do have to do uh, more performance testing for the mi microbial pesticides. So I talked about this already. We got our risk equation, and this, this is the global definition of risk. It's hazard times exposure equals your risk. Uh, the hazards identified through all those toxicity studies that I mentioned. And then exposure, you have some studies that you conduct, but a lot of it's also modeling. And uh, when you model, obviously, you can, you can do um, various aspects of the modeling. And, and I'm going to talk about some of the refinements that you can do with some of this modeling. But, and then, as I mentioned earlier, too, the reduced risk products are really lower hazard products. And uh, some of the products that are actually being registered now, they can't seem to find any tox endpoints. Not all of them, but, but there's some of them that they really... So, uh, <clears throat> And then FQPA, really all these items were looked at separately before FQPA, but now it, it's all put in to the same risk cup under that active ingredient. So if, if you're using something on your pet and you're consuming peas and it's treated with the same thing, that's all part of the risk assessment. If you're using it around your house for termite control, but then you got a grower that's using it, it's still considered in the risk cup. All these items used to be looked at separately, but now they're looked at together under FQPA. <clears throat> so the maximum residue limits are used for enforcement to make sure that there's proper application. That's what it's at the local level. They're looking at, okay, if you're exceeding your tolerance, you're, not probably, you're probably not using the product according to the label that was out there. So they'll use it for enforcement. Then it's also used for standards for commodities and trade, and that's also domestically as well as internationally. So uh, if, if somebody's shipping something across state lines, California, I think New York, they probably have a monitoring program to make sure that the, the pesticide residue limits are underneath those standards that were set. The, mac <clears throat> the maximum residue limit is only set if the dietary exposure risk assessment confirms that there's no, no human health concerns to any segment of the population. Obviously, Kids are the biggest segment probably that we're the most concerned about. Maybe women of the childbearing age is, is the next uh, segment of the population that, that we're concerned about. So the EPA, as well as any regulatory agency, they will not set an MRL unless there's no uh, human health concerns to any segment of the population. <clears throat> and then we also have every country has or is developing their own regulatory system. Some of them are independent, like the EPA is independent, and then some of them actually default to codex as a standard. But the, one of the problems is with commodities and trade is that not all countries recognize codex as a global standard. So talking about risk again, um, we have a risk endpoint, and what I want to mention here is that the NOEL, NOEL level is the no observable effect level. So when you do your, your uh, your tox testing, so you, you have different levels that you're testing. So most of the reduced risk products 
and the newer products are really a no observable effect level. Some of the older products, there is a low, lowest level of observable effect. And depending on where you ran your studies, uh, you could either have, you know, if you're below that level, you, you probably would never seen anything uh, in the studies in the first place. And then, and then from that level, your no observable effect level, then they automatically add a 10x uh, intraspecies and another 10x interspecies safety factor. And with FQPA, they also added another 10x for kids. So you have your 10x, you know, from humans to dogs, and then another 10x from within humans. So Robin and I, we may have difference in our gen genetic pro profile, so they want to add another 10x safety factor. And then for kids, they add another. That's the risk endpoint here that they're starting from. And then when they register a new product, most of the time they don't have any refinements, so they're kind of way out here. But, but if, if the risk cup seems to be filling up with no refinements, then they may look at refinements such as percent of crop treated. Uh, obviously not all the crop may be treated with the pesticide. They look at the diet. Um, and then the tier three, they'll even take the market data that, that's being generated by the USDA and see what the values are that they're finding there. When we do these residue studies, we're looking for what we call the worst case scenario. So if there's three applications that, that we think the grower may need, we'll put the three applications on there. If it's cucumbers, it's an insecticide, it's probably gonna be a one day PHI. So then we harvest that sample as it's at the farm gate with the one day PHI. Then it goes out to the market. And, but, but for us, when we do the regulatory work, we're looking at really what the farm gate value is. <coughs> So the registration process, you know, discoveries, probably two to five years, regulatory research, three to five years, and then EPA review, two years. So what's being developed now is probably really not going to be available to growers for another 10 years. And that, that's one of the issues we get when we have our workshops, Robin, because we, have, we had our workshop a week ago to set what our priorities are. And we're, we're not doing a discovery or even some of the long-term regulatory data. We're just doing residue study, and then we're submitting it to EPA. But our, our timeline's about five years to registration. And then you stack on top of that, you have the EPA review, the Canadian review, EU review, Codex review. You can just see that, uh, you know, by the time a commodity can actually use the product and trade can be quite long. Some of these, there's a global joint review process, and some of these are, are done concurrently but then Codex always does it after the review has been approved. So some of the international cooperation in these areas, oops. Um, you can see all the different regulatory agencies that are working on, on harmonizing the MRLs that are in trade. So now just a comment about the global joint review process. It's where several national authorities work together to review an active ingredient at the same time. So they receive the same submission. Um, they develop a joint schedule. They divide up the work. And then at the conclusion, they make their own regulatory uh, decision, which is independent. But what the hope is is that they end up with similar endpoints and the MRLs are similar too. So then, then trading is not impacted. So I just. There's a lot of information on here, but I really just want to focus on this chlorantranopril uh, product that was registered. And these are all the partners that participated in the global joint review process. So you can see the U.S. reviewed the toxi toxicology studies. Australia reviewed the residue chemistry. The United Kingdom, the ecotox studies. Ireland, the environmental fate. And then Canada reviewed the product chemistry. So you can see where you know, it, it's less redundant and you're using your resources more wisely that way. So in, in the end, the, the compound was submitted in 2007, uh, registered for joint review in the countries that participated in 2008, and now it's registered in over 100 countries. And the commodities that are treated with that product don't really need to be concerned when they're in trade channels, if, if they're going to be detected as, as an issue. And it's, it's really becoming a way of doing business. But the one thing I can mention is uh, in the EU, for example, they, they had a legislative change two years ago and, and made it very difficult for them to participate in this process. So 
Now they, they were kind of working along, everything was going fine, they have a legislative change, then they got to retool and then decide how they can participate in, in this, this global process. <clears throat> what, but what the hope is, is with these joint reviews is that we can have a harmonization of the tools, harmonization of the, the uh, data evaluation records that are used in reviewing uh, products, then, then those submissions, they're all the same. The, if, if you're in the U.S., if you're in the EU, your review is going to look the same as any other country in the world. So then hopefully the process will be something that builds on itself. More, more countries will participate in it, uh, more international organizations. And, um, and the other thing we hope is that the minor uses or special uses will be dovetailed into those reviews as well. So the grower concerns, diminishing reliance on codex MRLs uh, or, or just the refusal to use codex as an international standard. Um, that's, a, that's a problem for the growers. Uh, there's a growing backlog of reviews at codex. So we already have the new products registered in the US, but we're still waiting for codex to review it so then we can export to those countries that, that uh, respect the codex standard. And then there's a proliferation of, of country-specific MRLs. <clears throat> and that's what we call a positive list. So Japan has a positive, positive list. Korea used to respect codex. Now they want their own positive list. India used to respect codex. Now they want their own positive list. If the product you use on your commodity is on that positive list, you're OK. But if the, the, the product you're using is not on that list, then you're not going to be exporting to that country. And then the other thing I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about a little later is just the secondary standards with the food retailer MRLs. And they're even lower than the national uh, standards uh, or pesticide use restrictions. So, <clears throat> so the main, main challenges is a continued loss of key, key protection products. And this was actually something I got from a, a grower in the UK. They grow uh, salads, uh, green crops. Um, but what he indicated is their loss of key protection products, what we saw here with the loss of the organophosphates. And then there's a more limited me mechanism of action for the products that they are using. So there's more pressure on resistance management. Um, and then once you have resistance, then obviously you're losing your efficacy. And then we're already seeing uh, resistance to the pyrethroids and other, other compounds. So, what they really need is effective control with minimum residues uh, to meet the demands of their customers. Another grower reality, uh, growers need a wide variety of pesticide tools to, to control uh, their pests, but also to manage resistance and, and integrate with the IPM programs, and also the, with the greater demand on trade. So uh, in conclusion, it's really there's a scarcity of, of MRLs that prevents trades and delays transition to the newer, safer products. And this, uh, this, one's, uh, <coughs> this one also focuses on, on the secondary standards. So you have food retailers that set arbitrary pesticide residue levels or limit specific pesticides that can be used uh, to convince their consumers that their food is safe. But then the growers are forced to manage residues. Uh, there's no late season uses because they're managing pesticide residue limits. They're trying to mitigate the res residue levels. Uh, and then, then they have loss of quality because uh, poor insect control and less uh, residue leads to resistance as well. And fewer pesticide cause resistance and disrupts the IPM program. I think one thing I'd like to add there too is uh, you know, we, we develop these IPM programs, and then we have something like uh, the, the brown marmorated stink bug that comes in. And uh, the growers are basically throwing anything they can at the, the stink bug, and it completely destroys their IPM programs. It's almost, uh, almost like they have to start over. <clears throat> but uh, these trade standards also affect the organic production as well. We, we registered thymol for use in beehives that control the tracheal mites in beehives. Uh, in the US, it's an exemption from the requirement of tolerance.
but in the EU it has it has an actual MRL value. So, so we we have an issue because we we don't regulate the the, the residue level in the U.S., but the EU does. Uh, Spinoza, uh, it has uh, MRLs in the U.S. Uh, it's probably going to be regulated as a uh, conventional product internationally, so it'll be it'll require MRLs. Uh, but most of the biopesticides really, they, they don't have MRLs, they're, they're what's called an exemption from the requirement of a, of a tolerance in the U.S. But there's a lot of variability for biopesticides across the world on how they regulate them. Some of them actually require certain levels. Uh, some of them, like the U.S., they're exempt from tolerance, but, but they do a, a safety finding on it. <clears throat> Uh, secondary standards, it's, it's a way in which retailers try to respond to their consumer needs and their expectations, uh, but they're not really established following any principles or guidelines that's actually used as a rule of trade between countries. So it really kind of, I say ignore here, but it really complicates all of these other trade efforts that are going on because you have regulatory bodies working together trying to harmonize trade. And then you throw another standard on top of that, and the growers just don't know what to do. I mean, they, <clears throat> they can use a product that they think is going to be fine going to the EU, but then when it gets there, if, if the retailers reject it, it's a commodity that's going to be lost. So it's not necessarily risk-based or, or science-based. Uh, it really uh, doesn't really take into account special needs of developing countries either. And I say that because uh, a lot of these secondary standard slides that I use was from a uh, <coughs> colleague of mine that gave a presentation on this. But it's really a market strategy, and they're, they're really arbitrarily setting the standards. When I talked about setting the MRLs earlier, I talked that the MRLs are set on what the use pattern is that the grower has. And then it's determined to be safe. So if the levels were higher or lower, it would still re meet the safety finding. So if, if, uh, if a secondary standard set and they say, well, you know, the MRL is 5, we're just going to, we want all ours to be 2.5. Well, it's not really set on science. It's just set on what they think their consumers want to hear. And then finally, it, it can crowd out small holders. It can be adding unnecessary costs and also affects uh, efficacy of the product and yield. And, and for the growers, it really doesn't mean a better price either. So let me just close with a few closing thoughts. Uh, global trade of ag products, it's increased tr tremendously over the past five years, and that's in spite of the economic factors. And, and maybe that's kind of a look into the future where the global population is going. It continues to increase. Um, but this is really the bright, bright spot of our economy, is really agriculture. It's really kind of an exciting place to be right now. But there's a lot of uh, regulation of pesticides, not only at the local level, but the national and also international levels. And all that is really to ensure consumer safety from the get-go. Pesticide residues do have a major impact on trade, and it really requires a significant effort by the brokers, uh, traders, and the growers to manage to make sure that, that the trade continues to expand. And that, that's one thing we really want to see that that trade continue to expand in the way that it has been in the last five years. And growers are certainly impacted by the, the pesticide residue limits and how it affects their pest control decisions. What, what will some of the regulatory cooperation agreements uh, with Canada, we have a regulatory cooperation council that was signed by Prime Minister Harper and President Obama. They want to remove some of the regulatory hurdles that impact trade. Uh, will, will that uh, in increase our trade and, and harmonization? EU is also considering another type, type of regulatory trade agreement. Uh, the Pacific Rim countries, uh, there's also discussions uh, there about <clears throat> Uh, harmonizing some of the regulatory barriers that, that impact trade. Continued movement to harmonizations required to support the expansions and should be considered as more countries are developing new systems. So instead of each company reinventing the wheel, we should all be working together to make sure we're, we're really inventing the same wheel or using the same wheel. 
And then I have to ask, what will the next paradigm shift be in pesticides? We see what the Food Quality Protection Act did to the products that are being used now. But can we get to a point where, where the MRLs may be no longer required? I talked about the biopesticides. Most of those are exempt from tolerance. Some of the conventional products that EPA's reviewed, they're actually establishing uh, exemption from tolerance on the products that they're registering. Internationally, it's not respected, so we still have to generate residue data if we're gonna be exporting commodities abroad. So what I hope is that we can get to a point where we have some harmonization and the new products that are developed really won't require these, these trade barriers to uh, impact them. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions or comments. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.